All right, guys. So we have another movie that's solo directed by just one Coen brother, Ethan Coen, this time, who is making, you know, Drive Away Doll, which is um, also being helped made by his wife. Kind of like with Joel Cohen and Tragedy Macbeth with his wife, Frances McDormand, helping out. And so it's kind of happening again with Drive Away Doll. And Drive Away Doll is supposed to be the start of some kind of like trilogy of like uh, lesbians and B-movie type plots. I'm not really sure what they're doing, but I'm excited to see whatever they're going to do next with, uh, with this trilogy and the series of films that is coming up. And so, uh, with it coming up, I decided to rank all 18 Coen Brother films, or directed Coen Brother films, uh, before it comes out. And, uh, so, let's get right into it. Alright, so coming at the bottom, and number 18 is Miller's Crossing. And this is gonna be a surprising one, because a lot of people really like this movie. I know it's high on some people's lists, but... I don't, I, I don't hate this movie, and I don't really think the Coen brothers have ever made, like, a really bad movie. Uh, but I just didn't really like it that much, and I, it's just, it's very boring and sometimes very stale at times. Now, there are really good moments. Uh, one thing I just, like, the biggest highlight of the film is the soundtrack by, by their usual composer, Carter Burnwall, who, who's done, I think, most of their movies... And uh, I, and there are really some good moments. The Danny Boy scene with Albert Finney, you know, fighting off like the mobsters that are trying to assassinate him in his house. That scene's great. Uh, the so there are still some good like camera moments by Barry Sonnefeld. This was his like final film that he was a cinematographer for. You know, with the Coen Brothers until next year with Barton Fink, which would be their first collaboration with Roger Deakins, and they would have him for most of their films. And I do like some of the performances from Gabriel Burns, John Turturro, Albert Finney, uh, Steve, Buscemi, Steve Buscemi's like small part. And also I really like the scene with um, Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi uh, briefly shows up as like a cop who uh, assists in a big like firing squad shootout scene. That scene is great. There's, there's things to like about it, but most of it is just very stale and boring. It's hard to follow what's going on. It's got... It's like a mob film, with the stuff about, you know, there's government politics in there. It's all over the place, and um, it's not a Coen Brothers film I would recommend uh, watching or, heck, even started. This is like what you watch last after, like, binging all of them. So coming in at number 17 is another disappointing one, and that is No Country for Old Men. This is a tough one because this is like... This isn't just, like, you know, one of their, like, favorite ones. This is, like, the one that got best picture. This got best director for them. This got best, like, you know, screenplay, adapted screenplay. Su supporting actor, which I think that was well-deserved. I think this one is very overrated. Even more than Miller's Crossing. But at the same time, though, I think No Country for Old Man has got a lot better things going for it. Like... I think it's it's way more engaging to watch than Miller's Crossing because it's a it's really a simple story about a a guy on the run from like a cartel guy who's gonna kill him, but I think he made a little too much of a big deal of this movie. It's just a western version of the Terminator, and uh, this is like my like fourth time watching it. I'm watching it again. Like I just I don't know. I I just I, I like it less, but there's still a lot to enjoy. I think the acting is still good from. Uh, Josh Brolin, Tom Lee Jones, Javier Bardem, Kelly McDonald. Uh, Roger Deakins' cinematography is really great. This might be his bet. This might be my favorite, like looking or second looking from his. Uh, it's like it is still a great film to look at. I just think it, it really fails at um, script. The third act, I think, really falls apart. Uh, it's just there's no end to this film. There is really no end, and I just can't really get into it when um, you get to that, just like that third act. It all kind of goes down. It, it just, it all falls apart for me. But everything else before, I think, is just a great uh, cat and mouse western. And I, I would still recommend check it out if you like that kind of stuff. So, coming in number 16, uh, this is these are in Cohen films I think are overrated. Uh, I, I do like these ones a little more. But I still think they, they still have some issues. Uh, 
The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Now, I really liked a lot. Um, the, the look is so great for Roger Deakins. It doesn't look, I don't think it's as good as like No Country for All Men or True Grim when it comes to their westerns. But I really love that the first episode, the set or segment with Tim Blake Nelson, um, kind of like coming back after Old Brother Rock Thou, just singing uh, old faux country songs on his horse, and he's getting into all a bunch of shootouts, you know, and he shoots. Uh, Mr. Krabs in a bar scene. That's all. Love that scene. I love the second one with um, James Franco. One of his last performances in like a mainstream movie. As like a bank robber. And he gets into all these like hijinks. With like almost being hung by English Tog Packer. And then having to deal with like Native Americans. That's all fun. And then you got like the one with um, uh, like Brennan Glee. No, Liam Neeson. <laughs> And uh, Harry Potter's um, uh, cousin, who, who is like this guy who has like no arms and legs, and it's just Liam Neeson uses him as like a meal ticket because it's called meal ticket because he, he makes money off of him. That's a very like dis it's a very like disturbing story or s just sad story about this guy who gets killed. Uh, and uh, the one with uh, Tom Waits from Licorice Pizza and the guy who go mining for gold. Uh, that one's, uh, it's fun. Uh, and then there's the one with Zoe Kazin uh, as, like, a widow, not a, someone who's just, like, lo who's, like, trying to, you know, travel, I think, to California and loses her, like, brother along the way. Was kind of a slow one, and then, um, it was, like, a, but there was, like, a cool, like, the ending of it was kind of cool with, like, the, with the Native American fight. And then the last one was just such a um such a low one because like i said before it really starts high and i was loving it and then it just went right down because that's like the problem with anthology stories when you want to combine all these like different stories like you really gotta like you, you i feel like sometimes you you need to try to make it a little more consistent than just having each story take place in the west you need to do a little bit better than that and you'd almost think it, and i think it should always be the opposite you, the story should even get like crazier and crazier as you go along but no it was it's not a disappointment because i still liked some scenes in this but it could have used uh, a few rewrites to it so coming in at number 15 is i think still is their highest grossing movie and that is true grit true grit it's if it's one of those very uh, manly westerns, or this was when, like, I don't know if this was like, really a thing, but, like, if you look back at, like, late 2000s, early 2010s, I think, like, westerns were kind of making a comeback, but then, like, Lone Ranger, I think, killed off, like, Hollywood funding these movies. So, you know, you had, like, The 310 to Yuma, The Assassination of Jesse James, True Grit, you had Django Unchained, and then you had, um crap like um shit i'm literally just blanked on that josh brolin movie where he comes back to life the dc comic book i oh my god i forgot how that forgot what that movie is uh there is the uh and then there was lone ranger which was box office bomb uh but this movie uh you know is remake of like a john wayne film and you know, I, I look, I never, I didn't see the John Wayne movie, but I did look into it how, you know, that movie, the John Wayne movie is a very gung-ho, um, well, like, fully spirited film, has, like, a very, like, good ending where, uh, John Wayne, as typical fashion in his movies, like, run off in the sunset, but, uh, this movie is a lot deeper, and it's a more, like, more, I wouldn't say sadder, sadder, or, like, happier version, it's just a more realistic story uh the because i think the characters they feel uh not like these movie characters they feel like people who really existed and like this is just what they're that's this what they were like and uh the reform the performances are all great in this uh jeff bridges is great in, as this like marshall matt damon is great as this like goofy texas ranger um hilly seinfeld Steinfeld is uh, great as the main character. She leads the whole thing. Josh Brolin is pretty funny in it as like a, um, you know, as the guy who kills like her dad. He's just because, I'm sure it's, 
it's realistic. It's not a, a typical Western where like all the bad guys are just total badasses. This it's just it's just like a drunk guy or a guy in gambling debt. He's a total buffoon, and that's just how it was in the West. And um, the guy that he works for, who is played by Barry Pepper, Barry Pepper is an actor who he never really like. He's not a leading man. He's you know. He's always like a, he's always like in supporting roles, like in films like you know Saving Private Ryan, The Green Mile. He was in the Maze Runner trilogy, and to see him in this, even though he's like you know he comes at the very end, he's still pretty impactful as like the true main villain of the movie. He's really great. This is and this is definitely like the best performance that Barry Pepper has ever really given. I still like him as an actor, and I would still love to you know I would love to even like work with him, uh, see him in more films. Definitely a great actor, and. Um, the cinematography from Roger Deakins is still really good, and the, the Coen's direction is so great, and I like some of the funny moments with, um, you know, the dentist with the bare skin. <laughs> He's funny, and then I like the scene where Cogburn and uh, Maddie find the um, find the guy hanging and think it's Tom Chaney, and it's not. That's all funny, but at the same time, there's just moments that are very slow-paced, and this movie's only like an hour and 50 minutes, so I think it really should have, like, kept going. But I really think, uh, it, but it, it's definitely a film that gets, but that is really good in the middle of the movie. So that's that's my take on True Grit. All right, so coming in at fourteen and thirteen, so I gotta go with both the Coen Brothers' most uh, controversial or just not well liked films, and that is *Tolerable Cruelty* and *Lady Killers*, both thirteen fourteen. So not they don't not a lot of people really like these movies, especially the Lady Killers, which I don't get because I really like the Lady Killers. But I'll quickly you know let's just go your by in your order. Tom of Cruelty, which was uh, people don't like, some people don't even like this less because uh, this was like a higher like this was for higher for the Coen Brothers. Uh, it's like this wasn't even their idea, but at the same time though, it's still feels like a Coen Brothers movie at times. Like the end, like they hire a guy to kill um, you know, Catherine Zeta-Jones. That is so out of a Coen Brothers movie, guys. So some things about it just, they feel very Coen-esque. And I really do, I think George Clooney and uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones are really good. I like the performances from uh, you know Billy Bob Thornton's appearance. I like George Clooney's like partner. I uh, like uh, Catherine Zia Jones, like the openings, like his, like his, her ex husband. Um, I like he, he gets like third billing in this, uh, but Jeffrey Rush, uh, he has a fun opening sequence, but then he's not really in the rest of it. And I like the entertainer guy, the pri that private eye. Uh, all the characters are still really fun. I think there's a lot of fun moments, but it really lacks because there's just nothing but constant like court talks about subpoenas and i still i don't i don't understand that stuff but it's not like miller's crossing where i'm totally lost just because like i can kind of get behind some of the stuff that they're what they're saying about the plot but overall it's of cruelty it's got some good things about it and i don't think it's as bad as everyone says it is but at the same time i can kind of understand this is still like this was a this is a studio rom-com chick flick that the ladies can get into and then the, the lady killers a remake of a british film um I like True Grit. I still I did not watch it, but on its own, this movie is still fun. I still think there's some fun like camera moments. That I think the I think the characters are still fun. Like Tom Hanks, you know, this might not be his best performance, but he's really funny in this role. And uh, I like J.K. Simmons. Uh, Marlon Wayans is fun. Uh, the old late the old lady that lives in the house. I like her. They're they're great actors. I like the. Um, I like the, the the Asian guy who's always hiding the cigarette in his mouth, and then the 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 dumb football player guy. He's funny in it, and I it's just it's a it's a typical Coen Brothers comedy remake that was obviously cashing in on uh, that whole like I guess like remaking of heist films, you know, like Ocean's Eleven, The Italian Job, and then this. So look. These are both fun movies to watch, and I don't think there's anything really that bad about them, and I would still recommend check both of these movies out. So, coming in at number 12 is their directorial film debut, Blood Simple, 
Uh, movie which, fun fact, had a trailer made beforehand that was, you know, to uh, as like an investment pitch, and it was all helped by Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, who Bruce Campbell sadly was not in the movie. But I still enjoy the movie. Uh, there's a lot of really cool, like, well shot sequences, and this is still, this was like, you know, Barry Sonnenfeld still as their DP. He's still like his, he, he was definitely a talented cinematographer. The shots in this are very um, dark and dreary to look at, and it's, it's just, it's really well captured. And the, the directing from the Coens, it's, like, this was, like, this is when they were, like, really good friends with Sam Raimi. Well, they, they, they still are, but, like, this is when they were still, like, working close together. And there's, like, a, there's a shot in this movie that is just right out of a, um, that, that is very, very evil dead. So there is still that influence in there. And I, it's, it's just, it, I've been, like, this is, this, this, there was a point where this was my least favorite Coen Brothers movie. Uh, but I think recently as I started to make more films, I, um, you know, got into more to filmmaking. I, so I, I've been ten, I've been like getting a little more like, I have more sympathy for like first time films like this following the suicide, the su you know, the Virgin Suicides and Reservoir Dogs, because it's just interesting to see how they started off with like, you know, sometime with these, like these filmmakers, how they started off with very little money and what they do with their scripts. And I just really like this movie. It's a very simple movie, and the acting is really good from, you know, Francis McDormand and M. Emmett Walsh and the, the guy, the bad guy from Alien Resurrection. Everyone is good, and it's just a really good, uh, dark, disturbing movie that just really makes you feel cold inside. So coming in num number 11 is their second film, Raising Arizona, which I think, f which funny enough, um... In the, during their, like, their pre-Fargo area of, like, fame, the, I think this, I'm pretty sure this is, like, their highest grossing film, because, uh, not, because I don't, not really counting Blood Simple, because that movie was, like, really independent, uh, Raising Arizona did really well, and everything after this, what did, like, did not, like, like, pass its budget, and, uh, Raising Arizona is, did really well for them. And, uh, it's just a funny comedy. That's all I can say. This was, they wanted to go different with this one. They wanted, um, you know, to be more comedic. And, uh, the actors are really good in this. You know, the Nicolas Cage, their only time working with Nicolas Cage. And, uh, Holly Hunter, John Goodman, who would, um, you know, and Francis McDormand having a small scene. And they would continue to still work with the Coen brothers. Um, there's still a lot more, uh, like, Sam Raimi-esque shots in this the like the the whole that whole god that whole scene with like nick cage like stealing that scene is the best that's the best scene in the movie and it's it's just a, it's a wire it's a wild ride it's the cohen's um it just it's a very cohen brothers comedy that's just not very deep it's it's one of their movies that you just sit down and you have a fun time with and I got really nothing to say about it, but this is the only one that my dad likes, and my dad hates the Coen brothers. But out of all of them, this is the one that he likes the most.